Well, when I was 20 years old, I visited the German town of Dachau. And if you don't know, it was the uh, site of the first Nazi concentration camp in Germany. We had a British tour guide and he uh, took us around the camp and we saw the horrors of what had taken place there. But the thing which struck me most was that uh, of the people who lived there, who saw this unfold and yet did nothing, perhaps out of fear, perhaps out of something more. Yet either way, these people had been complicit in one of the horrors of humanity. And just when we, those on the tour, started to think, how could these people do this? The tour guide turned to us and he said, don't think that these people are any different from you or from me. He said, they were normal people. They were just going about their everyday lives. In fact, under the right circumstances, he said, this could have been a city in Britain, in France, America or Australia. These were regular people. And he said, this place must stay standing to remind us what happens so that it never happens again. Well, the warning from him was clear. This could happen anywhere because these people were no different from you or from me. And the tour guide, he wanted us to be confronted with that image that picture with what we saw so that we might learn from the horrors of the past and not make these terrible same mistakes that the German townspeople had made in turning a blind eye. The lesson of that tour guide looms large for me. Will I learn from the mistakes of the past and the warnings of what lurks within each of us or will I ignore them? Well, today, Paul would have us learn from the mistakes of the past that we might not fall into sin today. We have been tracing an argument uh, in 1 Corinthians from chapter 9. And it's basically been looking at this question of Christian freedom and what things limit our freedoms. Uh, We've seen that our love for another should trump our Christian freedom. We've seen that gospel proclamation can also trump our freedoms. And today, we see that the dangers to our spiritual health must limit our freedom. The very real and and serious danger that Paul's looking at today in this passage is idolatry. And here's Paul's advice regarding it. He's going to tell us, take heed of the past Remember God's faithfulness, flee from idolatry, and be careful what you participate in. Those are his warnings for us today, and that's how we're going to break up the passage. Take heed of the past, remember God's faithfulness, flee from idolatry, and be careful what you participate in. So let's look at taking heed of the past, verses 1 to 13. Well, verse 1 of today's passage begins... Uh, with the word for. And like all good investigators, we need to ask, what came before the word for? Well, at the end of chapter 9, Paul wrote these harrowing words. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul is concerned about the prospect of being disqualified from the prize, the imperishable wreath, the upward call of Christ. But Paul's concern is amplified for the Corinthians, and he wants them to realize that they're in danger. So he calls them to take heed of the past. And in verses 1 to 4, Paul recounts the Exodus generation and their escape from Egypt and journey through the wilderness. But I wonder, uh, when you read that the first time, did you notice the repetition in these sentences? Through these four verses, the word all is repeated five times. 
Let's read it again and uh, look out for that word. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. Well, what do we make of this repetition? Paul is clearly pointing out that there was something common to all of that generation. But what was it? Well, it was the passive experience of redemption in the nation-defining events of the Exodus. And Paul here uses language like uh, baptized into Moses and eating and drinking spiritual uh, food and drink purposefully uh, to symbolize that we, in fact, the Corinthians and us today, have something in common with these Israelites. See, these uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper are significant symbols of belonging to God's people. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are significant events which we hope correspond to a spiritual reality that we are the people of God. We're meant to see our similarity here with the Israelites, that we've both similarly experienced redemption, which makes what we read in verse 5 all the more challenging. He says, Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Despite all of them having witnessed and participated in the saving events of the Exodus, despite all having experienced the same redemption, we read God was not pleased with most of them. And in verses 6 to 11, Paul outlines to us what it was that they did which displeased God. Uh, And we won't work uh, in detail through these verses. There's lots of Old Testament references in uh, both the book of Exodus and the book of Numbers, which would be really fruitful to look at. We just don't have time now, but I'd encourage you to do that. But the things which displeased God, in summary, we see verse 7, idolatry. There's sexual immorality in verse 8. They tested Christ, he says in verse 9. And basically a summary of the entire Exodus generation and and that period, they grumbled against the Lord, verse 9. Each of these sins, it does have an Old Testament context, which would be worth reading. But uh, what is clear in each is that this sin led to destruction. And Paul brackets uh, these examples and these warnings with verses 6 and verse 11, which call for us to apply this to ourselves, to take heed of the past, as verse 11 says. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. That's right. The, uh, the Exodus generation was recorded for us, For our instruction, we are to heed the lessons of the past. The Old Testament has been written for our instruction today, how important it is that we study it. And this generation serves for us as an example, as a warning, not to do likewise. So Paul warns the Corinthians there at the end of this little section in verse 12, saying, Therefore, Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. The Corinthians were so sure that they stood. But Paul warns them to take heed that they don't repeat the mistakes of the past, that they don't repeat history. Instead, they need to take heed of what happened to that Exodus generation. Well, we do need to take heed of the past, but we also need to remember God's faithfulness. And we move into verse 13. Well, the very real danger of uh, not reaching the promised land exists. And Paul would not leave us thinking that 
our standing or falling depends upon us. The problem with the Corinthians was that they thought they stood. That is, they'd become so sure of themselves uh, and of their own knowledge, their own gifts and those things that they were relying on them. They were relying on wrong things. And that's where the danger lies. They'd started the race not trusting in Jesus, but trusting in themselves. And that is where the real peril is. But if you are sitting there now crippled with anxiety, thinking, what about me, not knowing where you stand? Well, know that those who trust, whose trust is firmly in Jesus, who rely on him for their salvation, have nothing to fear. Because God is faithful. So remember God's faithfulness. So we read in verse 13. Paul says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. We all face temptation in life. We're all confronted by sin. The devil's at work in the world to tempt us as he tempted Jesus. But here is our reassurance in the midst of this reality. God is faithful. God is faithful. We serve a faithful God and if your trust rests in him, you need not fear. Just like a loving parent who faithfully watches over their children, so God is a faithful father who watches over us. And Paul tells us we can trust him in temptation uh, in two ways. We can trust that he firstly knows our ability. He's not going to uh, tempt us beyond what we can, or allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. And secondly, uh, together with that temptation that comes, he provides us a way of escape. All this is for the purpose that we might be able to endure the temptation. That is, endure it and not fall. Uh, I remember driving to Geelong uh, after visiting Sarah when, when we were dating. And um, as I was driving along, a steam started to come out of the bonnet of the car. And uh, I looked at the temperature gauge and it was in the red. It was uh, a bit of a problem, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, but thankfully, uh, my dad had prepared me well so that I could cope with this uh, problem that was happening. I could calmly react and look for the next freeway exit and hop off the freeway and stop in the service station. And even then, having looked at it, I knew what to do. <laughs> well, I didn't know what to do. I knew who to call. I called my dad and I asked him what was going on. And, and um, my parents, they drove up and uh, they came and dad helped me fix the problem temporarily and then uh, escorted, us, escorted me back to Geelong. Um, we drove in convoy. Uh, my, my dad was the way of escape. Uh, you know, he helped me through that situation. I wasn't without help. Well, God is uh, faithful, like my father was faithful and my parents were faithful to me that day. He doesn't test us beyond our ability and he provides us a way of escape. Which leads us to the next point that Paul says for us to do in the face of idolatry, which, idolatry, which is flee from it. Verse 14. For the Corinthians who are in danger, Paul gives them uh, instructions that are both urgent and simple. He tells them to avoid idolatry by fleeing from it. As we read verse 14, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. The way of escape isn't complex, it's not sophisticated, it's not miraculous in many ways. It is the provision of a way of escape. It is urgent. It's not sort of leave calmly and uh, just uh, collectedly walk out. But it's flee. But it is incredibly simple, isn't it? I can remember when I was in, in uni university, um, 
I used to play a lot of games, and I'd gotten into a bad habit of downloading uh, media off the internet, and um, I can remember feeling convicted about that as a Christian. And one day I was talking to the staff worker of the Christian Union, uh, and I confessed this to him. And I think I thought he was going to give me some sort of, you know, empathy or, uh, you know, here's a 12-step here's a process for getting out of this. But what he said was incredibly simple and urgent. He said to me, Sam, you just need to stop doing that. I was a bit taken aback. <laughs> but it was the right advice. It was what I needed to hear it was the way of escape. Subsequently, I uh, stopped doing that and got rid of everything that I owned that I didn't own myself. It was a pretty simple instruction, but it was exactly what I needed to do. I needed to flee from the sin in my life, the idolatry which games and media had become, to such a degree that I was willing to break the law to do it. Well, similarly, the Corinthians, they're in dangerous territory. A and you might be too. And if you are stuck in sin, then hear Paul's advice. Flee from it. The danger is very real. Flee while you can. Well, Paul moves us into the final section now, verses 15 to 22. Be careful what you participate in. This is Paul's final warning. and It's simple. It's be careful. Be careful what you're taking part in. And in these verses, verses 15 to 22, Paul gets to the crux of the issue, what he's been building up to. Here is the problem. Here is the situation. The Corinthians might be asking themselves at this point, well, you know, what's the issue? What's all this background information for? What are we in danger of? And Paul here reveals it. He says, when they partake in these temple meals that they're so fond of, they participate in something more than just eating. They participate in idolatry. They participate in the worship, he says, of demons. Well, how does he get there? Well, he wants them to connect the dots with a couple of examples where participating in a meal means something more than just eating a meal. Firstly, he, he says the Lord's Supper. Now, when we share the Lord's Supper together, uh, we aren't physically eating or drinking Jesus, that's not the point. But by faith in Jesus' sacrificial death, we are spiritually fed. That is, our, our faith is increased. And we share the benefits of his death. And in that sense, we participate with him and those who are allied with him, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's Paul's first point that they're meant to connect. The second he says, look at the example of the Old Testament priest and the sacrificial system in verse 18. See, they would eat uh, the sacrifices after they'd been sacrificed. And the point here is the same. By, by eating the meal, they're actually associating themselves with the Lord, who those sacrifices were sacrificed to, and assuming the blessings of that system. Well, this brings us with Paul to the issue at hand. Look at verse 19 with me. Paul says, What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. Pagans think they sacrifice to a God. The Corinthians think they, they sacrifice to nothing. But Paul says they are sacrificing to demons. And Paul's point is that in eating the meat that was sacrificed to these demons, they're actually in fellowship with them. They're entering, so to speak, into their household, into their territory. They're becoming associated with them. And in some ways, they're binding their allegiance to these demons. And the Corinthians through this act, are actually worshipping demons. They're becoming idolaters. And Paul concludes in verse 21 by basically saying, you can't have it both ways. 
You can't be aligned to two different parties. You can't be part of these demonic meals and Jesus' meal. You're in danger by taking part in both of being evicted from the Lord's meal and the benefits that are associated with allegiance to the Lord. Well, we might be sitting here thinking, I'm in no danger. I don't feel tempted to worship some clay, metal or wooden idol or even eat a meal that's part of some kind of religious celebration. But these are real issues for some and they need to be handled with care. But just because we might not be tempted to worship uh, a clay idol doesn't mean that we're not in danger of idolatry. I think we in the West, we think too little, in fact, of the spirit world. We might even dismiss the idea of demons altogether. But we should be cautious. We should caution ourselves from thinking that we're immune to idolatry. For there are many idols in Western culture and they're things that our society prizes so highly. Tim Keller's written a book, it's called Counterfeit Gods and it's worth a read. He points out that there's many idols in our Western culture, things like love, money, sex, power, and they all vie for our worship. These things in and of themselves can be harmless, but when they become our heart's desire and things that we love, trust and serve above all else, well, they've become our God. So a couple of helpful diagnostic questions for you and for me as we consider our lives. Maybe in this COVID period, it might have revealed something. Is there something that you were willing to bend or to break the law for? Or what is it that you spend most of your time thinking about or dreaming of? That could be your idol. We must take action to avoid the peril of idolatry. Ask those diagnostic questions. Then take action to ensure that you escape the danger. Why not tell someone your struggle? Seek help. Observe some boundaries. And flee, friends, flee. Leave that idol behind and cling to the Lord who alone and only can save. Brothers and sisters, will we take heed of the lessons of the past or fall into the same sins of our fathers? Or as the passage says, shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Or Will we trust Jesus, who is faithful, and flee idolatry? Let us be those who, clinging to Christ, flee from idolatry.